So Luke Taylor, thank you very much for coming on our podcast and speaking with us today as uh, the first traditional searcher in New Zealand. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, good morning, uh, uh, David. Well, good morning from New Zealand. Uh, my name's Luke. Uh, I am the CEO uh, of Scientific uh, Software and Systems Limited, or Triple S, as we call it here, uh, which is a cybersecurity managed service provider uh, based out of Wellington, uh, which is New Zealand's capital city. Uh, I'm the first uh, traditional search fund operator and now search fund CEO in, in New Zealand in this market uh, and have been part of the search ecosystem uh, community for about three years now. Um, and you yeah, come from a pretty diverse background, uh, David. I, I started my life in, in the military, um, so or my work life rather. So um, I was a, a, an officer in, in the New Zealand Navy for 13 years uh, and then transitioned into a corporate uh, job. Um, work, working both in New Zealand and also in Australia, uh, and then into a consulting role um, prior to uh, my search journey. So um, have a background as an, as an operator, general manager uh, and, and executive, uh, rather than from finance or, or private equity, uh, and, and came, in, uh, came into search really with a strong desire to be a business owner, uh, to be a chief executive, and, and to be able to run a business of my own. Um, so that's what was the, the real pull for me into this, uh, into this career path. Thank you for that. How did you come into contact? How did you find out about search funds as a model? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think a lot of us first timers in new markets, um, you know, search finds us as much as we find search, and um, and it was it was a almost a chance encounter, I guess, with somebody who knew about search. Um, so, unlike some of the more established markets around the world, our MBA programs um, don't teach. Uh, ETA uh, and and search isn't a, a well-known construct in New Zealand. In fact, you could probably count the people who really truly understand search funds on on one hand um, in this in this country. Um, so it's not something that is uh, you know that you come across in, in your normal uh, I guess sort of work or study life uh, as an you know, as an exec or a mid-career exec. Um, I was part of a, a startup uh, community, uh, and as part of that community, I actually met uh, an investor from Australia who knew about search funds, uh, and I had owned a small business in the past, and so I was in the process of looking to buy another small business, and I had this conversation with um, a person who is now on my, my cap table uh, and on my board, um, who, who knew about search and knew about the search community in, in Australia, and so he... Uh, suggested that I might want to do some research and, and look more into that space. Um, and this was at the beginning of 2020. So just as we head, in, head into that COVID year, so we had a lot of time on my hands during various lockdowns to uh, to, to do some research. And, 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 and that was my um, the beginning of my journey uh, into search. Um, and, uh, and that actually resulted in me talking to a number of searches around the world, uh, you know, in America and Europe and Australia, uh, both search operators and also investors um, to really try and understand what this thing called search fund or searching was. Um, and it was off the back of that that I thought that there was a, a great opportunity in a place like New Zealand uh, and also an, an extra layer to that opportunity, which was to be the first uh, to sort of overtly put their hand up and say, I'm going to run a search fund. Interesting. Looking at your search fund, could you tell me how you decided on the name? Uh, okay, so Acheron Capital uh, is, is what I called uh, the search. And look, I come from a Navy background. Um, HMS Acheron was the first uh, ship to survey New Zealand waters uh, when oh, okay. New Zealand was discovered. So, uh, and it's also a river, um, the Acheron River is a river that's uh, near where I grew up. Um, so there was some nice, uh, I guess, some sort of synergies to that. Um, I guess the trade-off was that I spent uh, most of my time correcting people's pronunciation of it. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> look, it, it, there was that nice sort of throwback to, uh, to the first ship to kind of search New Zealand and, and, and me being the first searcher in New Zealand. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for shedding light on that. Your uh, investors, uh, I think there's about five um, for that search fund, and generally uh, they recommend about a dozen. And I was curious, what was your thinking behind uh, the investors that you wound up partnering with, and why did you not go after more? So, so I have I have about twelve uh, on my cap table. So, so I do have um, a, a standard looking structure um, and a standard, I guess. Um, 
you know, quote unquote traditional um, search fund. There's a lot of different variations to search structures now around the world. And I think one of the things that has evolved is the fact that the model has had to adapt to new markets with different legislative and tax uh, structures and different investor uh, desires. Um, but my, you know, being the first in the market, the, one of the decisions that I made very early on was to keep it as close to the sort of Harvard Stanford model, um, traditional model as possible, um, but then uh, move the areas that needed to be moved in order to meet New Zealand legislation and, and corporate structures and tax structures, etc. Um, so I started off with 10 investors during the search process, um, well, 10 units and, and 10 investors, uh, both at, um, funds, high net worth individuals, family offices, so the usual uh, the usual suspects. Um, and then uh, as we moved into acquisition, um, there were uh, new investors that were bought in as part of that acquisition process. And, and so we have 13, 12 or 13, I believe, if you include myself now um, on, on the register. Uh, and it's a really great mix of, uh, you know, different size investors, large funds, small individual investors, plus uh, a great mix of geographies as well. So people, um, investors from the US, from Europe, from Australia and from New Zealand. That's great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I just looked at the website and it had five investors listed, but are there some then that preferred not to be listed? Yeah, and, and to be honest, we probably need to update the website, um, which has not uh, been high, not been not been high on my uh, the, the con from a content perspective, hasn't been high on the, the to do list since making the acquisition because I've been so busy. Um, but uh, no, no, I think we, you know, I, I think yeah, I, I listed the the bigger investors uh, on there. So I didn't list uh, individuals. Okay, I was just trying to understand a little bit of the the details, like if if there's a, a situation where some people might not want to be uh, seen. Uh, some because you're kind of first to market in that respect. So it's curious, like what what are some of the challenges that you faced uh, convincing people that this is a good opportunity? Yeah, I think when you when you raise your fund in a new market, you just there's another layer uh, that goes into that conversation with investors. Um, well, there's two, there's probably two. So I'll, I'll give you both both sides of that. The, the first is if you're talking to an international investor, uh, there's that element of familiarising that investor with your local economy, um, why your market makes a good market for search, and, and what differences there are, and you know, at a macro level um, between uh, the small business environment in your country and the small business environment that um, we see in the US, where the uh, the structure has been born out of. Um, so it's important to uh, have a have a view on on what regulatory environment, what business structure or corporate structure and tax environment exists, whether there are any legal ramifications or considerations, uh, and also how easy is it to do business in small business in, in your country. And then there's also the the size aspect. Obviously, New Zealand is a small is a small country. We, we're as big as some you know mid sized cities in in the US from a population perspective. So the the total number of small businesses in your market was, or in my market, was was one of the main considerations. What you know is this market big enough to sustain a search, which requires a certain degree of quantity um, in order to be able to get through that search journey. So that that was an element. And then the other side is also that most investors, most international investors, will want to see that you have uh, strong local support for a search fund, uh, and that requires you to bring local investors into your into your fund um, and the challenge in, in an environment where search is new um, is that you have to then educate investors as to what a search fund is so whilst those investors will know intimately the local market and and they will either agree with your thesis or not um, you have to then uh, educate them on the structure of a search fund why it's successful what it is and, and what's in it from them from that perspective. So in that uh, raising of your fund, you know, that, that, that fundraise journey, there's that extra layer of, um, of information that needs to be presented to investors. Okay. Now about your education, I'm just curious, why did you go after a DBA instead of an MBA? Yeah, so I've, I've done an MBA uh, and then I finished uh, my MBA and uh, went into the, the DBA program, which was a new program at the business school that I studied my MBA at. Uh, and uh, so I rolled straight in um, uh, post MBA into the into the doctorate. Uh, and I did that for personal reasons. I've, I've always wanted to, to do a doctorate or to study at that level. Um, you know, I'm a very uh, academically focused person. Um, 
you know, I, I call myself a pracademic uh, or, or, or practitioner academic. So, um, uh, and, and there are, you know, there are people out there in the consulting world that would foot in theory, a foot in application. Yeah, that's 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 right. Um, and you know, at the time that I was uh, was researching my DBA or, or beginning the process of understanding whether I wanted to, to to fully commit to a doctorate, I was also researching search funds and. I went back to the business school and I said, hey, look, this is new in New Zealand. It's not new globally, but it's new in New Zealand. So it's actually really curious to me that that nobody has attempted this here because we have a great small business environment. So that in and of itself makes a really interesting research question. And, and that's what I pursued as part of my doctorate. That's perfect. My goodness. You should write a book on that. Look, I've met some fantastic search uh, academics as part of my journey um, and, uh, you know, found myself last year at, in the US in Boston with uh, at Harvard with um, at the Search Fund Educators Conference uh, with people that are teaching Search Fund uh, around the world. Um, and, and so I think there's a, a natural space potentially uh, in the, the Search Fund education space, um, but obviously getting through my own search journey is, is the priority at, at the moment. So sure. I think in the future, maybe, um, uh, but no, right now the, the, the research piece is sort of moving into the into the rear vision mirror uh, and, and definitely focusing on on being an operator. Okay. And how, how many, uh, how far in are you in terms of being an operator? So. Uh, I, we acquired uh, on the 1st of July, uh, we had a, uh, well, that's when we uh, completed, uh, we moved, or I moved in as the, the CEO on the 1st of October, so we had a sort of lockbox up until the 1st of October, uh, so I began, uh, you know, day, day number one for me was the 1st of October this year, 2023, uh, so I'm just coming up to the end of my first quarter uh, as, as the CEO here, um, and the focus has nice. very much Almost been on, days. yeah, look, get, get to Christmas, uh, get through the first 90 days, uh, learn learn how this thing works um, and, and kind of enjoy, enjoy the process at the same time. And you're taking interviews. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> uh, so your, your career is interesting, varied, but somewhat focused at the same time. You mentioned you were in military for 13 years and then you're not hopping around per se, but you're, you're spending a couple years in different organizations after that. I was just curious, what was the big difference there between spending over one decade in one industry, if you want to call it that, one organization in the military versus every couple of years? Is that just a function of civilized life uh, from your perspective? Or could you talk at all from coming from the old school way of staying with one organization and uh, hopping around a little bit more? Yeah, I think um, uh, in terms of the, the length of time in the military, um, even even though that seems like a long, you know, a reasonably long period of time to be within one organisation, the, the military is a very diverse organisation, and so the the roles that you hold within the military uh, can be quite um, varied. Um, so, okay. uh, as you progress through your career, you can find yourself changing uh, reasonably, you know, even at a functional level, changing what it is that you're doing as you transit, you know, as you progress through your career, about once every three years or so. So, within that you know, 12, 13 year period were three or four significant different movements um, as I specialized and as I moved and was promoted uh, and, and you know, sort of tra traveled through that journey. Um, so there was uh, definitely the experience of, of changing roles, moving into new environments, um, you know, dealing with transitions, that sort of thing. Um, from a, from a, a corporate perspective, um, you know, that tr the big transition point is obviously the transition from the military into the corporate environment. That's that's the most disruptive. Um, so finding, finding a place to land and, and, and in Nice soft landing um, to learn the commercial side of being a leader. Uh, you, you obviously come out of the military with great leadership skills, great people uh, management skills, um, and a bunch of really interesting and diverse experiences, but lack the sort of hardcore commercial acumen that your peers have had over their equivalent 12 or 13 years in corporate life. So finding a place to land is, is really important. And, and I found a great organization to land in. Um, and then about two, two, two and a half years later after that, I was picked up and headhunted into a role in Australia. So there were a couple of um, promotion opportunities that, that were there for me to sort of accelerate my journey in, in corporate life. Um, that got me to sort of where I, where I wanted to be, which is to be a, a CEO and a business owner. What did you learn in the military? I think the military for me was a 12, 13 year apprenticeship in leadership uh, and, and, and how to manage people. Um, I think the uh, application to search fund life uh, is that the teams that you're leading in the military tend to be quite small. Um, they tend to be sort of less than 
30 or 40 people at a time until you get higher up in the in the organization uh, in the navy um you know you find yourself on a ship in charge of a department or as a head of department um, of a team of about 30 or 40 uh, then you may go on to a you know in my in my case i commanded uh, or captained a ship of my own which had a team of you know 30 or 40 so you, you sort of hover around that uh, that space from a team size and that has a direct application into small business life um, you know as a military leader you often um, find yourself uh, you know out in the field or deployed uh, and with a lot of levers that are available to you to pull so it's almost like running a small business within a within a framework right so I found that the most natural uh, and comfortable point for me post-military was actually in the small business environment. So whilst I worked for some some larger corporates, um, my, my wife and I actually, we, we owned and operated a number of small businesses ourselves. And it was in that environment that I was the most happy and the most challenged and the most satisfied. Um, and I think it was that direct relationship back to having a small team and a small number of levers to pull on and then the uh, the space and the freedom to maneuver within that environment, um, which is challenging and, and, and most rewarding for me. That's interesting that you shared that actually the military isn't this monolith, but there's many like companies, if you will, or, or uh, roles to, to fill within it. That's because uh, I've never been in the military. I've only looked at it from the outside. I've come across several people in military all over the world. And one thing from a, a civilian perspective that I've found if I'm generalizing, is that they seem more grounded. I, I think uh, it, it would seem that you're tested more and you kind of like smelted down to your core, if you will. Whereas in civilized life, uh, you, it, there's a bit more agility, a bit more possibility to fake it till you make it, I would, I would say. And some of this might be sloppy speak, but I was curious from you having, you know, being a foot in each camp is, as seems to be your, your nature. Uh, what, how do you see civilized life as uh, both having advantages and disadvantages uh, versus someone in the military? Do, is, is my assessment at all accurate as far as like, is there a certain groundedness and authenticity from military um, experience? I, I think that, uh, you know, looking at looking back and reflecting on my career in the military, I think the uh, the the testing comes from the fact that you, you tend to be put into positions of accountability uh, and leadership at a at a, at a younger age, uh, and then and then you either deal with them or you don't. <laughs> um, so I think that there's an element of um, look, you provided with some great training and a great environment to learn, and you're given leadership from some people who are just exceptional um, people leaders. Um, and then you're you know you couple that with the fact that you're you, you're generally working in environments which are quite uh, stressful. Um, they might be quite adverse environments overseas on deployment. You, you know the military don't, don't don't tend to end up in the nicest parts of the world. They tend to end up in the, some of the worst parts of the world, dealing with really challenging situations. So you're constantly tested, uh, and and you fail quite a lot. Like you make bad decisions, and you learn through. Um, getting things wrong, but having a framework around you that doesn't let that failure be too critical. Um, and so as a young uh, person growing up in my own leadership journey, um, you know, I had the, both the benefit of being able to witness other fantastic leaders, uh, coupled with the, you know, some great training and then put into environments where that was really tested and, and honed. Um, so, you know, you, you do come out, you know, the other end, I think, um, with the ability, like I, I look at the, my, my, my job now and when something happens, it's a bit stressful or when, when something doesn't go quite right or when a, a customer's upset or a, there's, there's some issue within the team, it, it doesn't um, kind of rock me too much. It, it's just you take a deep breath and then you, you come up with a plan and, and you execute the plan. So it, it, dealing with adversity is a big part of being in the military. Uh, and I think that's really set me up. Uh, post-military life and into civilian life um, but then there's also um, you know downsides to that environment as well and, and certainly not uh, uh, you know not having that commercial acumen uh, at the level that my peers out, outside in, in civilian life had was a steep learning curve um, and something I've had to really focus on over the the past you know decade or so uh, post-military. Always trade-offs. You brought up adversity, and that's kind of where I was going to go next. Uh, I was curious what your thoughts were with the relationship between comfort and adversity. It seems that we're built for the latter, and if we don't have it, we're miserable. <laughs> and we seek out comfort, but comfort kills. So I was curious, having been in some of the, the not nice situations, 
uh, and you know, having a family of your own and now a company of your own. What what are your thoughts on comfort? I think probably my thoughts on adversity. Um, I, I, I the military, you know, if I, again, if we, we're we're talking about military life, it, it is a life where you are oftentimes uncomfortable. Um, you know, I, I was a seagoing naval officer, so I spent a lot of time at sea, and that's not a comfortable environment. Uh, it's a small environment. You're around a lot of people in close confines. You've got no personal space, and the actual physical environment can be quite challenging um you know the ship moves around a lot it can be terrible weather you know you might have to be doing your job and and you know in the middle of a, a storm uh and and you might do you sometimes have to forego a cappuccino oh absolutely <laughs> and, uh, and but the thing is that there's no um you know if you're you know a couple thousand miles away from wherever you need to be in the middle of the ocean what's your other choice right like you you just have to deal with it um and so what you learn in the military is if, if those that don't um you know put their hand up and say hey this isn't for me and i'm, I'm going to leave that you know the, those of us that were out there doing the job we you just take a deep breath and realize well no one's going to do it for you i just have to push through this and so your your, your comfort becomes secondary to whatever the task is at hand you're not looking for opportunities to be comfortable because you're never in an you're never in a comfortable space to start off with so i think it was more just the ability to say look i i don't want to be here in this rough weather any more than the next person but you know take a deep breath you know focus on the task at hand and, and get the job done um and so if i look at my my role as a chief executive now there's definitely environments where i think you know, I, this this is uncomfortable, um, but the team are looking to me, um, and and so yeah, I have to take a deep breath and and get through it. So that having gone through that experience, I think was was really beneficial. I imagine it would have been, and yet you go into tourism where the expectation is almost the opposite. Could you talk about that transition? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, it was, uh, again, it was a really soft landing for me coming out of the military. Um, the tourism business that I work for, one of New Zealand's largest tourism companies, and tourism is a huge industry in New Zealand. I think it's our largest or second largest export earner. Um, so it is a big industry. Um, and the uh, the company I, I worked for was a, a maritime tour operator. So they had a lot of boats um, and they had some ex-Navy staff working for them. Uh, and they were, so they were used to Navy people as much as, uh, as anything. And, and so going into that environment, into an operations management role um, where um, where my job was to make sure the wheels kept turning, I guess, um, was a nice place to land after the military. Um, you know, I was still working with people. Um, I was working with moving parts and, and things, you know, big assets, um, buses and ships and stuff. Uh, and so that was a, a great way to kind of dip my toe into the commercial world without having a, a huge degree of direct commercial responsibility. Um, and, but be, also being in that sort of comfort zone of big moving things. Um, mm. So that, that was fantastic. And, and learning, uh, I, you know, what, what I reflect on my time in tourism is that it's just the customer service aspect of tourism, right? The the experience, the customer experience, the dealing with customers, the, the, the sheer volume of people that you deal with and making sure that, that you're delivering a once in a lifetime world-class experience for people that have traveled many, many hours to come down here to New Zealand was was super important to the businesses I worked for. And it was at their core, like these businesses had uh, excellence and customer experience at the absolute core in the DNA of these companies. And they were very, very good at it. And it, I look at where I am now, which is in IT services, and we're still delivering a customer, we're a customer experience business as much as a tourism business is, delivering a great outcome for our clients and an experience um, that uh, that delivers more than what they were expecting is, is at the heart of what any service business is trying to do, regardless of the technical industry that it's in. So, um, you know, those that, you know, that, that time spent in those customer facing roles was super valuable to my career. What skills would you have brought from your significant military training into customer service in, in tourism? Did it help you in terms of like conflict resolution or uh, operations and planning? Certainly the operations and planning part, because it was a big operation I went into. Um, you know, we had uh, mul multiple geographies. Uh, we had a lot of staff, um, a, a lot of moving parts, a lot of coordination. Uh, so there was a lot of discipline needed just to keep everything running uh, on time. Uh, and, and what I took into that was 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 the people management side. Um, so I loved working with people um, and, and being thrown into an environment where there was a lot of staff was something I really enjoyed. Um, what I learned was the customer experience side of things. And I was, 
very lucky to be in an organization which had that in their DNA. So you, you, you know, it kind of gets washed over you and you, and you absorb how to, how to, how to behave and how to treat customers and how to, you know, how to work on customer experience and, and design customer experience. And, and I really enjoyed that. Um, so it was, a, it was something I threw myself into and, um, and learnt um, and, and did that, you know, I guess taking the operations management side of my military background uh, to that organization, which was beneficial for them. And I imagine you're dealing with clients from around the world. Yeah, very much so. All different nationalities, um, people who speak English, people who don't speak English. Um, but like, you know, New Zealand is probably one of the furthest away places you can fly to from the US, right? It's a, I think my direct flight to, to Chicago last year was 19 hours. So it's a big, it's a big journey wow. to come down here. So you, you want to be respectful of that. Uh, you might be the, you know, we've all been on holiday uh, and we all know the things that are really stressful and really upsetting you know just those little tiny little gestures that you can do as a tourism operator that can just absolutely make or break somebody's investment in their holiday um, was what we really enjoyed like you could be the difference between them having a fantastic day and, a, and an experience that they remember for the rest of their life or having a terrible day and and so that the ability to influence at that level um, is was fantastic i was a tour guide in japan for several years and I went from like disliking rainy days to start off our tour to really liking rainy days to start off our tour because it was a nice level set, but it's only going to be uphill from here. That's right. Yep. Um, so going uh, now further ahead into your search, uh, were you, it seemed like you were focused on New Zealand, but then and you kind of have to focus on one thing. If you're going to be regionally focused, you need to be industry agnostic it seems? Was that your uh, situation as well? Yeah, I think New Zealand, if we look at New Zealand as a search fund market, we have to sort of consider two things. One, one, it's a new market, uh, but second, secondly, it's a small market. Um, so New Zealand is a, a country with a population just over 5 million people. Um, look, we're, you know, normal English speaking Western economy. Um, so a lot of the sort of economic macros, I guess, that uh, are, are aligned, uh, but we're proportionally like significantly smaller than you know, searching, uh, you know, in, in, even in Australia, right, which is sort of 10 times the size of New Zealand. So you have to, you have to be industry agnostic to a certain degree because the depth in our niches is, is so much more shallow than any larger market, which is just a numbers thing, right? So um, if you're wanting to, you know, specifically focus on one uh, quite tight niche area, you can exhaust all of the businesses in that uh, niche very very quickly um which is obviously a negative or you know or, or downside to searching in a small market but the upside to that is you can map out every business in a particular niche as well so um it's uh, you, you have the ability to really kind of sit down and, and know who is who uh, in in the industry um spend a lot of time being focused so you can narrow it down and you can spend more time on those businesses, on those target businesses, approaching them in a, in a much more targeted way, in a much more personalized way. So uh, it, my experience with searching in New Zealand wasn't one where we had, where I had a mass outreach campaign, where I built a list of 10,000 companies and then sent a direct email campaign out to them. It was one of individually meeting business owners, knocking on doors, spending time with people, learning industries, learning the business, uh, and then making that approach a much more personalized one, which has a higher degree of success. Um, and you can do that in a small market, or well, you need to do that in a small market. Planning seems to be one of your strengths. If not, uh, it you certainly sell it well. I was curious, what, what surprised you about, about search? Was it harder in some respects, easier in some respects? Oh no, it's hard. It's very hard, uh, and it's a it's a long journey. Um, you know, where am I now? Sort of three years, maybe three and a half years um, since the first sort of consideration uh, to buying that business, and and that's a long period of time to be you know with that single minded focus, uh, but also not knowing what the outcome is going to be. Uh, so it's not until the the day that you walk into the business that you really have kind of completed that acquisition and then you go through this period of you know did i buy what i thought i bought and is it going to work um so the the, the actual search process is is long um it's process oriented uh, it's exhausting um and it's arduous and there's there's full of speed bumps and hurdles um 
but the reward is at the other at the other end is, is fantastic so i think what's it, i don't know if it surprised me as much because because pe plenty of people warned me <laughs> um but you have to show up every day day in and day out and if you're not out there talking to business owners no one's doing it for you um so that keeping keeping uh, your foot on the throat of outreach and the task is um, over a long period of time is is a challenge it's one thing to hear uh, someone's advice or, or experience, and it's a very different thing to live it, uh, I imagine. Uh, could you share how many LOIs you signed? Uh, I think in total, um, I put in about, I want to say 10 or 11 LOIs. Um, I had the target of having my first LOI uh, sent to an owner uh, within the first three months um, of the search. Uh, and then- wow. And, and then and you, you know, met that target. I, yeah, I met that target, uh, and and then you go. You know, the first part of that search journey is very much a, it's almost a calibration exercise, uh, learning what makes a good LOI, learning how to make an offer, and how to negotiate through that offer process um, is is a very important part of those first couple of months, three months, six months. Um, so that you know, when you do get to sort of LOI number five, six, or seven, uh, that those are really good shots on goal for you. Um, and that you're having good, meaningful conversations with with, with good business owners, uh, in, in a way that gives you the opportunity to move into to, to due diligence. Those numbers seem to be outside of the statistical average. Uh, I think it's about eleven months for the first signed LOI, four LOIs before you get to an acquisition. Uh, do you think that that's a function of being in a new market or being in New Zealand? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't searched in, the, in another market, so I couldn't say with any certainty. Um, I know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very well connected with the searches in Australia. We was very collaborative. We all, we all work uh, together. Uh, we we catch up every month. Um, and I think it was it, it was a bit of a heuristic, you know, a bit of a, a rule of thumb to say, you know, in that sort of three month first three month period, you want to get an, an offer out, uh, even if it is just to learn how to get an offer out um, and, and to go through that that process. But also I think it keeps the searcher focused on, look, you're not gonna buy a business without making an offer. So <laughs> learn how to make an offer um, as well. So that, that was certainly something that we, we we used as a target across Australia and, and New Zealand now was, you know, get, get your first LOI out around about sort of month three, yeah. Okay, interesting. And how did you know that this company was the one? Because it seems to be in a different industry than what you're used to so far. Mm, yeah, look, I, how did I know? I think reflecting on it, like you don't know, right? Uh, you never know. Um, and you have to, you, you can't let yourself, I think to some extent you can't let yourself think of a business being the one, because what I learned was that businesses can 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 fall over during due diligence. So you have to remain uh, dis dispassionate. Um, I, you know, uh, you have to be curious, but disconnected to a certain extent from the business. Um, and you have to be objective. It's really important to be objective during a diligence process, right? Um, but you know, when I first spoke to the, the business owner and the, and the chief executive at the time, um, I, I knew that we had a, a good, you know, a, a good opportunity in front of us. And I remember saying to some of my investors, "Look, we've got a good one on the hook right now. Um, we should focus on trying to reel this one in. Um, this is a good business and a good industry. I, I like what I see so far, and, and that." That to me is look. If we can get a good offer in, then it gives us the opportunity then to validate that during the due diligence period. Um, now that I'm three months in into the running the business, I'm I'm thrilled with what we've purchased, uh, and I'm having a great time, and it's a great business. I mean, it's not without its challenges. I think everything is, but um, at the same time, certainly I, I uh, I'm very grateful for what we managed to acquire. So, being that you're three months on this side of a good decision. What could you tell people being on the other side? Like what, what signals should they be looking for that uh, would hopefully lead them to where you are? I, I think I spoke to a searcher, a prospective searcher yesterday actually about, about this. Um, and, and I think you really have to, I think searchers need to make sure that they're considering uh, what's in it for them as, a, as an individual, uh, as much as they are considering the investment. I think it's, especially for some searchers, it's really easy to go to, to the space of considering the investment from the investor's perspective like does this make a good investment does it 
tick all the boxes on my financial model? What's the IRR going to be? What, what's the economics of this? And, that, and yes, that is a really important part of the search fund process. That's how you get investment in the first place, right? But you, you, you're the one that has to turn up day in and day out, uh, get out of bed every morning and want to go to work and want to work with the people in this business and want to be doing what it is that the business is doing. And so I think one of the key things that you have to consider and that searchers have to take into account is, do you see yourself running this business? Like when you close your eyes and you think about the job that you're you're applying for, can you see yourself enjoying that? Like, will that satisfy you? Does it tick your boxes from a, a personal perspective? Because the there is a direct correlation to how successful an investor will be and whether you like that business, whether you want to turn up and whether you can do your best work. Uh, in that role. So um, I think the, the, the element of um, can I still see myself doing this job in 10 years time and eight years time, um, you know, in the long term, uh, because that is what's going to get you through those difficult times. And that's what's going to yield you that value creation um, on that journey. So um, I would encourage searchers that are looking at opportunities to just take a step back and say, you know, when I'm explaining to my friends and family what it is I now do for a living, and I say, I'm the CEO of X, Am I, you know, do I say that with pride? Uh, does it excite me? Uh, and, and can I, can I visualize that? I think that's a great answer. Uh, I'm not three months into a, a CEO role like you are, but it seems like there's so many variables that the most important one would be yourself. So if you're aligned with like the way that you want to live your life, then that's probably the rest can take care of itself more or less. Yeah, I think it's a big uh, determining factor in whether you will be successful. Um, you know, if you, if you, enjoy what you do uh, and, and you're passionate about it, then you can give that extra piece of yourself to the business. Um, if it's something that you, it just isn't aligned, then that's going to be difficult. And if it's difficult, then those financial outcomes that you're, you're, you're wanting to deliver will, will be proportionally difficult as well. I imagine you're still at the phase where you're taking it all in, uh, not, not rolling out your 75-year plan at this point. But uh, are you thinking of staying within New Zealand? Are you thinking of doing like uh, tuck-ins or roll-ups in, in New Zealand or elsewhere? I think we're at a, in a position uh, where uh, I'm just trying to be super tactical uh, rather than strategic. Uh, the focus at the moment is it has been on let's get through the first quarter which as of this afternoon, I think we can probably say, yeah, we got through the first quarter. Um, and then it will be, well, let's get ourselves through the budgeting period into the end of our financial year. Uh, and then once we're at that point, uh, then it will be, okay, what does year one look like? And what, what what do we think year three is going to look like based on what we know year one's going to look like? So it's very uh, small steps. Uh, but in saying that, the opportunities for organic growth, uh, market expansion in New Zealand or territory expansion in New Zealand, plus uh, you know, potential market expansion into Australia or, or other markets is, is on the cards for us. Um, and there are always opportunities for an organic growth as well. Um, you know, the business I'm in or the industry I'm in is cyber security. So it tends to be a little bit frothy um, from an acquisition perspective. Um, so with a, you know, we, we'll need to consider that um, when those opportunities present themselves. But, um, you know, we're not, um, the, the growth options for us in, in the near term are very strong. That's great. How about search in New Zealand? Do you think it's just getting started? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a wide open playing field. Uh, and uh, I know that there are uh, fantastic searches in Australia that, that would consider opportunities in New Zealand. And so I'm trying to encourage my peers in New Zealand to put their hand up. Um, I think a market like New Zealand's can easily sustain two or three operating search funds per year um, on a sort of rolling basis. Um, and, you know, the part of the... Uh, obligation I feel now is to be a, almost like a live case study that people can look at uh, and the you know, investors and searchers in New Zealand can look at and say, well, look, look at what's, what Luke's doing. Um, that's, that's a, 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 you know, an example of what a search fund can achieve. Um, and, and that I think will uh, help, um, you know, that process of uh, talking to people about search for the first time wasn't an easy job. Um, so I'm hoping the next person has a slightly easier job uh, and then I can play a part in that. Um, but I think New Zealand's a fantastic, a fantastic economy, and, a, and a, we've got a great small business environment. Uh, and, and so I, I encourage people thinking about the search in New Zealand to to get in touch with me, and and, and let's have a, a proper conversation. That's great to hear, and much appreciated. Uh, I guess last question for me would be: 
being that you were first and having to educate uh, as well as um, present to these investors, uh, what what's one thing that you learned in that that you could pass on to to other folks and and uh, being first in their countries? Uh, it takes it, it, it takes longer uh, to raise that local capital, um, so be realistic with your time frame, uh, and I think you'll end up with less of it than what you originally planned. So if you're in a new market to search and you're planning on getting forty percent of your cap table sourced locally. Uh, and you don't come from a strong deal background, like I didn't come from a, a private equity background, so I didn't bring an investor with me or two investors with me from my own network, uh, then that's a challenging journey. Um, and just allow yourself the time to have those conversations because it's going to take two or three really good conversations with an investor before they uh, understand. Um, and and the, uh, there's a big role for international investors in that space. Uh, to who are interested in new markets to also uh, be available to talk to potential investors in that market to help them understand what search is. Um, so if you are an investor looking at a new market, making yourself available to have a video call with a local investor is both beneficial to that market's ecosystem from a search perspective, but also hugely beneficial to that searcher as well and getting their own fund up and running. Well, Luke Taylor, thank you very much for talking to us today and sharing a lot of wisdom with us. It's very, uh, very interesting and much appreciated. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you for your time.